as we did last week. I am recording this for our YouTube channel. That way we can have it uh, for uh, that and people can go back and watch it and listen. Uh, what we're going to do is I've got a PowerPoint um, that I'm going to uh, be sharing. So let me get this started. And okay. Everybody can see that, I'm guessing. And so what we're going to do is go over here to the PowerPoint. Sorry for the computer running a little slow. It does it does that from time to time when uh we're when we're trying to get things to run. So hopefully it will catch up with itself here in just a minute. There we go. Um but tonight, this PowerPoint, uh, I will go ahead and tell you, is not original to me. Um, I'll give you a little backstory as to what, as to where I got this PowerPoint. When I was a student at Freed Hardman, uh, I took several classes under Ralph Gilmore, and one of them was the it was seminar for Bible majors. And what we did is we went through uh, different things that pertained to uh, problems, uh, and I put that in quotes, problems in the church, uh, problems connected to the Bible, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so one of those things is we went through some paradoxes and not just any paradoxes but we went through some paradoxes of god and so what i want to try to do is get this powerpoint to run uh hopefully it will go into its presentation mode here in just a minute uh but it is paradoxes of god that we uh, that for some uh, for us it, they're not Par they're not necessarily paradoxes let me well it's going to it's going to mess up this time i don't know why it does this well we will try this again uh let's do this from start and it needs to quit okay hold on just a second folks we are going to we are going to try this one more time and let's see, we're going to quit PowerPoint. Don't mind the man behind the curtain, as they said in Wizard of Oz. Don't mind the man behind the curtain. We're going to try this again. Uh, but anyway, uh, when we were going through this in seminar, uh, we he gave us the PowerPoint. And what he did is he told us, he said, guys, what I want you to do is I want you to use this in any uh, capacity that you can. Use it in uh, class material. Use it as a sermon. Uh, make it a multi-part sermon. Whatever you want to do with it, use it. It is yours to have. And so we were given this PowerPoint. And I am thankful that he did because I have done this uh, PowerPoint in the past uh, at a couple of different places. And they never, uh, the people who have heard this uh, were like me. They had never thought about it in these terms, thought about God in these terms, that there is a paradox that we have to wrap our minds around. Uh, and it, all pertains to the attributes that are uh, given to God. The attributes that we find, uh, and I'm using the list that is given in the Defending the Faith Study Bible. As I have said before, uh, if you do not have one of these Bibles, you need to get one of these Bibles. But we're just going to touch on a few of them tonight. One of them is the omnibenevolence of God, and then 
That is the all-loving God. We know that to be the all-loving. Omnipotence, which means he is all-powerful. Uh, for some reason, it is not wanting to open. We're going to get to it. Uh, bear with me, folks. The PowerPoint is wanting to mess up right now. Omnipresence, which is meaning that he is everywhere, that he is aware of what's going on everywhere. Then you have the omniscience, which is that he is all knowing. And all of this, it, we are also going to talk about just for us uh, for a minute, we are going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. Now, the sovereignty of God is very interesting. Uh, and I might have to, let me see if I can figure this out. Um, I might have to stop the share for a second. Let's see. All right. Hold on just a second, folks. Let me get this going and then maybe we can go. But the sovereignty of God is we know that he is the absolute supreme ruler and controller of all that we see and know. That is, that is really the crux of who God is, is he, ha he is the absolute control of this. And what we find is that he is, uh, that he is a loving God. He does have vengeance towards people who, towards people and beings who are, uh, who go against him. And so let me do this. I'm going to go back over to zoom. I am going to share the screen again. We're going to try this again, folks. I bear with me. All right. Let's see if it'll work this time. And it's saying no. Huh. I don't know what's going on. Let's see if we can do it like this maybe hopefully if it works it works if it doesn't we will just uh upload the nope it's not going to work let's do it this way oh well okay don't send I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying. Uh, Zoom has been messing up with everybody. I will have to say uh, the uh, the other night um, somebody was saying that Zoom uh, crashed on them. So I'm hoping that does not happen while we're doing this. Uh, but we are we are trying to get it to uh, work. Um, I don't know what the what this is doing. I have no idea. I'm just at the mercy of the computer right now. But anyway, um, so what we know is that the attributes of God are very much present throughout Scripture. We know that if you go over to 1 John 4, 16, just talking about omnibenevolence for just a moment, uh, we know that it says there, and it's the shortest biography you can have of uh, God of anything. It's God is love. God is love, and so we we see. And I don't know why PowerPoint is messed up right now. Um, well, can can y'all see that? Let's just do it this way. Can y'all see that? Okay, we're just going to do it this way. Hopefully. Uh, y'all can, hopefully y'all can see that. And we're just going to do it this way. We're not going to fool with, uh, we're not going to fool with trying to make it full screen and slideshow and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, the paradoxes of God, we are looking for the biblical concept of what, who God is and what he does. The sovereignty of God, we've already talked about that for a minute, but it's the divine prerogative based on his will and nature. He is the supreme being. You can just look at these passages of scripture. Jeremiah 10.10, 10, you find that he, Jeremiah describes him as the everlasting king. 
uh, in Genesis 14, 18, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1, he is, uh, you, he is viewed as the most high God. Uh, Exodus chapter 8 and chapter 9, verses 10 and verses 14, respect, uh, respectively, uh, to those passages, you find that none is like God. Uh, all power is given from God and all power is of God. Matthew 28, 18, all power is given to me by God, uh, by my father. Uh, and he, then, uh, uh, Christ goes on to give the great commission in Matthew 28, 18. Uh, what we find is that when he says the words, all power is given to me uh, in heaven, has been given to me in heaven and on earth, all authority comes from God. Romans chapter 9 verse 20 also talks about this. And we know from what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 that Christ has preeminence. And so that is the sovereignty of God. But here are some paradoxes that you might not have ever really put into your mind. Uh, one is the knowledge of God. We talked about this uh, just a moment ago about God being all-knowing. And him being all-knowing, we have to understand that the paradox is that one can know God but then also one cannot know God. That is, a, that is a paradox. How can one know God, but also cannot know God? So you have, you have that paradox happen. The second paradox we're going to try to look at, we won't get to all of these tonight. I'm just going to go ahead and mention that to you to, uh, from the outset. We will not touch on all these tonight. The uh, second, uh, the second one is one can be like God and one cannot be like God. That is a that is a paradox. How can you say that you can be like God, but God is all powerful, God is all knowing? So how can you be like God? One cannot be like God. There are things that we can strive to be like, but there are also things that we cannot be like God in, in the all knowledge and all powerful. And we know that there are things that we just cannot do that God can do. Notice this, God can do all things, the omnipotence of God. God can do all things and God cannot do all things. What does that mean? We're going to get to that. The fourth paradox is the immutability. God cannot change or and God can and does change and God cannot change. That is a paradox because we know that he has changed his mind in the past. Just look at Genesis chapter 6. What does it say about him changing his mind? He had he had created man in his own image in Genesis 1, but then by Genesis chapter 6, he he was saddened that he had even created man because they were after their own fleshly desires. And so he changes. He can change his mind, but he does not change in some respects. And then the fifth paradox we're going to talk about in this presentation is the omnipresence, which is God is everywhere and God is not everywhere. And how does that, what does that mean? Uh, in its entirety. So let's look at this first paradox, the knowledge of God. One cannot, one can know God and one cannot know God. This is going to be one that is a little tough uh, to understand because notice what this says. God is incomprehensible. Can we discover God's limits? No, uh, check these questions. Uh, look at these questions. We're not going to take the time to go to every single one of these. Uh, we're not just uh, we're we just don't have the time to go to every single one of these passages. I will make this PowerPoint available to you. 
Uh, if you would like for it to be available, I will make this PowerPoint available for anyone who would like it. But can you discover God's limits? Think about that according to Job chapter 11. We know that Job uh, had some uh, questions that he had, he needed, he wanted to ask, and he was dealing with some things, and his friends, I put friends in quotation marks, friends and acquaintances were talking about God and talking about Job and talking about his life, and we find in verse 7 through 9 this question. He even, so far, makes it very clear. He says, can you discover God's limits? And then in Job chapter 15, notice the first, first four come from Job. Do you hear God's secret counsel? There are things that we just do not know go on behind the scenes. There are, there are conversations. I use this passage often and I will probably continue to use it till the Lord comes again, uh, which is that the secret things, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord your God. There are things that we just cannot understand. These are the fringes of his ways, Job 26, 14. Notice in Job 37, uh, close to the end of the book, he discusses, in grave detail, uh, Elihu discusses in grave detail, consider the wonders of God. Now, Elihu was a different uh, character as far as the, other, uh, as the others were concerned. He tried to be a voice of reason, yet he still had his issues. Elihu did. But he was saying in Job 37, consider the wonders of God. Look at everything that is around you. Consider them and look at them. And Psalm 18, verse 11, and Psalm 97, verse 2, you find that darkness hides him. We cannot see God. No one has seen the face of God. Uh, let's remember that. No one has seen the face of God. Now, Moses uh, did experience God's glory, but his, but his eyes were covered until the Lord, uh, until God passed him and he was on the, his eyes were only opened after he passed and he could look at the back of God. He could not see, he did not see the face of God. John, John, uh, who wrote the book of revelation when he had his when he wrote Revelation, he did not see the face of God. He was in the presence, but he did not see the face of God in that vision. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, you find that man cannot find out all of his work. We just cannot find out all the work that God does. We know from... Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, his, un, uh, his understanding is immeasurable. We cannot understand his understanding of what goes on. We just can't. And one passage that I have used multiple occasions, I continue to use it to this day, which is his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We will not be able to understand the ways of God because they are higher than ours. And we find Paul goes even further. He takes it a step further saying, how unsearchable are his ways? Who has known God's mind? His peace passes understanding, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. There is mystery in the godliness of, of God. And as I've already mentioned, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God. So there are things we cannot know, but then there are things that we can know. 
wicked, the wicked don't know God. We know this. Job chapter 18, verse 21, we know that God, that the wicked do not know God. The sinful do not know God. If they knew God, they would not live the life that they do. Make sense? John chapter 14, verse 7 and verse 17 you know God if you know Jesus. And if Jesus abides in you, you know the Father. He makes it very clear that if, if I abide in you, then if you abide in me, then I abide in you and you are of my Father. He, he makes it very clear about that. The world, going back and connecting this to Job 18, verse 21, the world does not know God. Look at the state of our country. Look at the state of our world right now. And people will say, oh, God, God is, uh, uh, people do know God. People love God. I have a very big question about some people who claim to know God, but yet use God as an excuse to be able to do what they want to do. We cannot use God's grace as an excuse to sin. We cannot use God's grace as an excuse to go and do whatever we want because the world does not know God. Those not knowing God can come to know him. At one time, you might have been in that category. You might have been right there where you had no idea who God was, but we know, uh, but you we're told about him and you came to know him. Uh, Philippians chapter three, verse 10, that I may know him. First Thessalonians four, verse five, the Gentiles did not know God at one time. We just, we know that from, we know that. Uh, First Thessalonians one, verse eight, rep, rep, bleh, okay, let me try that again. Retribution. <laughs> To those not knowing God, there is consequence. There are consequences to not knowing God. And what are those consequences? Well, one, uh, the biggest one, the major one, is if you die not knowing God, you do not get a home in heaven. You go to hell. That is, that is the consequence. Titus chapter 1 and verse 16, one may profess but not know. Remember what Christ said. We talked about this on Sunday morning. Remember what Christ said. That, uh, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. One may profess that they are a Christian. One may profess that they know God, but do they really? Do they really? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30, we know him who said. We know him who said these things. First John uh, ver uh, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, we have come to know him. And First John chapter 4 and verse 8, uh, if, you if you don't have love, you don't know God. If you don't have love in your heart, you don't know God. And so we find that even though, going back to this uh, slide, even though God, we cannot know certain things about God, and we cannot know certain things about what he does. We can, to an extent, know God in the way that the Bible says we can know him. That makes sense. Um, you have any questions? We are not going to go to the second paradox just yet. I want, uh, we just went through a lot of scripture, a lot of stuff. Does anyone have any questions whatsoever? Speak now or forever hold your peace. We'll go to the next one if, uh, if you don't, if you don't. Okay, we're going to go to the second paradox. The second paradox is the likeness. One can be like God. One cannot be like God. This one is tough. 
for some. Uh, be the simple reason is that when we think about this, you're having to put your mind into a state of, well, can how can I really be like God? What can I? What am I supposed to do? And so, let me let me go to this, and let's. Let's look at a couple of things. First, notice these passages of Scripture. These all come from the book of 1 Timothy. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness, notice this, godliness and honesty. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10 but which becometh women uh, professing godliness with good works. Godliness is said again. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We talked about it in the first paradox. We talked about uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Here's what it says. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. How was he manifest in the flesh? Christ. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That is just the simple truth of God, and that's the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself rather unto godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable into all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. What is godliness? Well, let's go back here. We can be like God in the fact that we can show godliness and honesty. We can profess godliness with our good works. We know the mystery of the, we, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is that mystery? Well, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. We don't go into fables and go into controversy, but we go into and exercise ourselves in godliness. Godliness is profitable to us because we have a promise for a life that now is and of that which is to come. You can go all the way through 1 Timothy. We will go through these quickly, but 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, it's listed as one of those things, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's a good thing for us to be like God or try to be like God. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw yourself. Understand that. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So what do we find throughout the Bible? Well, the covenant name of God. Do you know how to say the covenant name of God? It's four four to six Hebrew letters. There's something, Ricky, that you can learn how to do is read from, you don't read Hebrew from left to right, you read it from right to left. And so if you're going to read it from uh, right to left, it's yod hey, vav hey, or Jehovah is an easier way of saying it. Jehovah, yod hey, vav hey, the covenant name of God. 
And it probably is from Hebrew, meaning to be. To be. And think about that. He is to be, and we are to be like God. The nature of God, well, the essence is that God is spirit. John chapter 4 and verse 24. God is not, a, is not physical and not in man's form. Now, he came in man's form in the uh, way of his son. God made physical. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. That is his son. But God the Father is not physical. He is a necessary being. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. What does he call himself? I, I am. God is the God of the patriarchs. He is personal. He has intellect. He's sensitive. Will. Uh, he's... Uh, Speech, sight, hearing, everything. He is personal to us. And so you go on further. The attributes of God, we've, we're talking about them right now, but the attributes of God are this. Moral, I can be like him. God is holy. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. God is good. Matthew chapter 19. He is good. God is true. John chapter 17 and verse 3. We know from just the high priestly prayer of Christ, that God is someone who we can put our faith, put our whole being into believing because he has done immeasurable things for us. I'm going over here to John chapter 17 for just a second. And what he says in verse three, and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent and we know that god is righteous the non-moral attributes of god that we cannot be like are the omnipresence the omnipotence the omniscience and the immutability of god psalm 139 in Psalm 147, we find that. Are there any questions? We've been going for uh, roughly about 35 minutes. Are there any questions or thoughts on this? Uh, do you have any comments? Would you like to make a comment? Uh, is there something that you might not understand that you like clarification on? I'm going through here, just make sure no one's raising their hand. Yeah, yes, Gary, I'm going to ask to unmute you, and you can uh, unmute yourself, and then uh, there you go. All right. You know, you say you're wanting to be like God and everything. We get in lots of situations, and we need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? You yeah. are absolutely right. I, and here's the thing, folks, I, years ago when what would Jesus do was the big thing, WWJD was the big thing. It was on bracelets. It's on, it was on t-shirts. It was on car bumper stickers. It was on everything. You saw it on everywhere. And a lot of people got, a lot of people, uh, myself included, um, got numb to hearing it all the time because it was being used everywhere. It was being used for anything. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? But we do have to ask that question sometimes. As Gary pointed out, we have to ask in certain situations, what would Jesus do? If someone comes to you and asks you a question and you are faced with a dilemma of, do I answer the question about my faith or do I leave do i just leave well what would jesus do what did jesus do what did jesus do he would have stayed and he would have proclaimed that he would have proclaimed he would have expounded on the word of god he would have said he would have told everyone what the word of god said 
we have to remember that though there are things that we can do that we can be like God in those respects. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Gary, you are absolutely right. Uh, anybody have any other comments or thoughts? Let me see. I'm scrolling down here. Make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay. We're going to try the, we're going to try to get to this last pair this third paradox. We'll leave the last two for uh, next time but the omnipotence of God, which is God can do all things and God cannot do all things. That's a, that's a paradox that you, ha you have to wonder about. What do we do with competing absolutes? The autonomy of man that we have free will, but the sovereignty of God that he is all powerful and he is an absolute being. What do we do with these two, uh, these two competing thoughts? Well, Let's look at what the scripture says. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 14, is anything too hard for God? Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Nothing is too hard for God. We have the we have the Bible answering itself on questions that were asked let's go to a, or on statements think about this the lord god omnipotent reigns matthew 19 verse 26 with god all things are possible psalm 115 verse 3 he has done whatsoever he pleased ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 he works all things according to his will Job 42, verse 2, no purpose of his is restrained. So we find that there are things, those are talking about the omnipotence of God and the what we can know about that. So let's move on to the next slide just quickly. There are two men uh, from the fifth, from the fifth ish century, if I can talk. Pelagius and Augustine. Pelagius said this about uh, what, and you figure out which one. You figure out which one sounds more accurate. Freedom of will is plenary power. Sin is deliberate choice of evil. Sin is the knowledge of evil. There is no original sin or inherent evil. Adam's sin injured only himself. Now, we understand that Adam's sin did not just injure Adam. Now, we do not believe in what is that. We don't believe in the fact that there is original sin obviously we don't believe in the in the original sin concept but we do understand that adam and eve sinning brought sin into the world the i i hope that is understood we we're on the same page there now augustine says this sin is inherent hereditary depravity Election is an act of sovereign God. Sinner cannot effect regeneration. Grace is irresistible. You cannot resist the grace of God. Regeneration is the act of the Holy Spirit. And salvation is the sovereign act of God. That is to, that is to say that he is, that salvation is only uh, done by God through the Holy Spirit, and that once the grace of God comes on you, it's it, it, you can't resist it. Well, we know that there are people who resist God's grace. There are people who resist the power of God to salvation. So we know that those uh, that that's a thing. I want to point out something. 
that is very difficult for some people, especially atheists, which is the problem of evil. How is it? They, they, this is how they will put it. How is it that a God of omnipotence, all powerful omniscience, which is all knowing and omnibenevolence, which is what we know to be all loving. How is it that a God of these characteristics allows evil to take place, allows sickness to take place? Well, uh, notice what they're doing. They are putting that on God. They are saying, how can God be uh, allow evil? Well, God is not evil. God is all loving and God is all knowing. Satan is the one that brings in the evil. Evil exists, folks. The problem is not with one statement but the sum of all four and knowing that evil exists, Satan exists, but the atheist would have you say, well, we just, you know, God, God, if you're to believe in a God of all love and a God of all knowledge and a God of all powerfulness, then there is no way that evil would be in this world. Well, they need to understand that there's a different situation. Defining omnipotence, God can do anything, can do anything at all. God can do anything he wills to do, and God can do anything which power can accomplish. Those are the three definitions. If you're going to define the omnipotence of God, the all-powerfulness of God, then those are the three definitions you can use. God can do anything. God can do anything he wills. And God can do anything which, uh, which power can accomplish. And so what we find is that the three aspects of the will of God coming from Leslie Weather, uh, Weatherhead uh, from, her, uh, from this book called The Will of God the ideal will, Second Peter chapter three verse nine, not willing that any should perish, God, uh, God would have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Can man defeat this aspect of the will of God? Yes, yes. People, uh, people can uh, not willing that any should perish. There are people who perish. God would have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, there are people who do not come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the ideal will, circumstantial uh, circumstantial or conditional will, what God planned to do and has done in the circumstances of our sins. John chapter 3 and verse 16 is a prime example. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should Uh, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, can man defeat this aspect of the will of God? Absolutely. They can by not believing in God, right? There are people who do not believe in God today. So can they defeat this aspect of God? Absolutely. The ultimate will of God, the punishment of the wicked and the reward of the righteous. We know these to be heaven and hell. Can man defeat this aspect of the will of God? Absolutely not. We can defeat the ideal will uh, as, as a human being with free will. We can defeat the ideal will of God, which is that not willing that any should perish. We can defeat the circumstantial and conditional will of God, which is that God sent his son for salvation of this world and that uh, there are those who do not believe in God. We can defeat that will, but the ultimate will of God is the reward and the punishment. And understand this, going to James, and this is where we're going to end it tonight, folks. If you go over to James, 
And notice what James writes in James chapter 1, verse 13 to verse 18. Notice this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one who is tempted, when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then when desire has conceived itself, uh, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Notice, I no one can say, they are tempted by God, for God is not evil, nor does he tempt anyone himself. So, whenever someone asks about this thought right here, about God can do all things, what, what does it mean? Think, remember this, and how... And, what does it mean to us? Well, there's the ideal will of God, which is that they, uh, he, would, he would love nothing more than everyone to come to a knowledge of him. There is the circumstantial that God planned to do and has done in the circumstance of our sins. He planned for his son to be sent. He planned it. And there is the ultimate will of God that he knows that there's going to be, it, he knows of the judgment. We are told of the judgment and there is a reward and there is a punishment to those who follow him and to those who don't follow him. And so we have to remember that. Uh, is there any, let me, uh, well, first, are there any questions uh, about any of this that we have talked about tonight? um that you might have uh before we uh stop sharing the powerpoint and stop sharing the screen are there any questions uh you can just throw your hand up any comments of the same uh if you have any let me look yes gary uh go ahead and unmute yourself and you can you know you're talking about temptations uh the you know a lot of people are tempted not to go to church because of so many activities going on on Sundays. They plan a lot of these activities. These people do. Of course, a lot of people are off work then, but that makes people have to choose between going to church, worshiping the Lord, or going their own ways. And it depends on how strong their faith is, is which way they go. Absolutely. And honestly, uh, remember, remember that we were talking about that as well. And the thing is, and this is what really, what really bothers me. Um, and I don't know if it's just that it has, it, I, I get bothered by it more now that I am an adult and now that I am a minister um, but the amount of excuses that are made, the amount of excuses and you, and you, you probably can attest to this. I'm sure that, uh, Ricky and, uh, Morris, uh, can attest to this. Uh, Nick can attest to it. And if, uh, Freddie was on here, he could attest to it. The amount of excuses that are made for why someone does not come to a worship service or why someone does this or does that or says this or says that just take ownership. I mean, if you made a mistake, take ownership. If you went against God, take ownership of it and say, yes, I went against God. Yes, I did this, but I have asked for forgiveness or I would like to ask for forgiveness because I know I need help. Why, why is it that we have, I think we have forgotten 
And I'm a, I think, and I hope I, I want to say this and I know I am probably going to step on some toes. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and say this right now. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing uh, my screen. Um, I want to say this and I hope I, I, I want to say that I'm not trying to offend anyone. However, thing is, we have got to be understanding that it is okay to ask for forgiveness. And it is okay that if we are in person, you can walk forward and make it right before the church. And you can ask for prayer. I think, and Ricky, it, Ricky Morris, it, Nick, I know Nick is on here, but if you, if y'all uh, have a thought about this, uh, then by all means, jump in here, unmute yourself and jump in here. But we, for several years I know of, uh, probably close to 20 years that I've been paying attention to it, I guess. Um, the amount of people that come forward on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night has dramatically dropped. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the denominational world's stranglehold on what is viewed as an altar call or whatever, whatever the reasoning behind it is. I don't know what it is, but we need to understand that it is okay. It is more than okay to come forward on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, or a Wednesday night in front of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you that I have done it a couple of different times and I am 100% uh, behind doing it because how can you, it, how can your brothers and sisters in Christ help you if they don't know you're struggling? I mean, think people about that. Yes. People may not want you to know. Right. You're embarrassed. Right. Uh, and that's another, that's another thing that you have to work through. And, it, and that's the reason why repentance and why, why that part of either salvation or that part of coming home to God is so difficult is because you have to work through the embarrassment. You have to work through the cycle of, well, what are people going to think of me? What is God going to think of me? And we have to remember that God doesn't care. He, if you come home, he remembers your sin no more. He doesn't want to think about it anymore. All he wants to see is that you are willing to come home. And he wants to see you come home. Um, I think that it is very liberating uh, to go for, uh, to come forward, uh, knowing God's love. And we talked about it tonight, knowing God's love, knowing God's all knowing and knowing he is all powerful and knowing that he, he is so gracious to us. Um, that should give us comfort to be able to go forward, uh, to ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> Um, and well, yes, you have some, you always heard this. You have some that have an image to uphold. There are miss or two, miss two good shoes to go up front for anybody to know if they don't want to do that or they think that they will be respected like they were before. And that's a, that's a problem of ego, honestly. Uh, it, right. It, 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 that's a problem of ego. 
uh, it's, and that's the reason why um, I love Psalm 51. Uh, really, I love all the Psalms, but Psalm 51 is probably one of the great, uh, one of the greatest Psalms uh, besides Psalm 23. Because Psalm 51 is create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. It is David's plea to God. It is, it is his cry out to God to please create, please help me in doing this. Uh, yes, Ricky, I asked to unmute you, so you should be able to do that. There you go. One thing, Will, I think we forget is Christians, uh, we're supposed to be brothers and sisters. Right. We're supposed to have love for one another. And we are supposed to be able to talk to one another. And I think we forget that so many times that we're a family. And we do what is best for the family. And if it means walking forward and confessing your sins, that's what you do. And I just don't understand people that are I think you go down front or uh, ask for anything that a family member would do. Right. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to say this uh, along those lines, and we're we're uh, folks, we're out of time. Um, but I like this kind of discussion. Uh, I remember, uh, back, oh, this was in, I guess, 1998, uh, sometime in that, uh, vicinity. I was a, I was a small kid and we were about to leave northwest alabama and go down to central alabama uh, my dad had accepted a job in central alabama and so uh we were going to go down there and uh on a sunday night and my dad told me later when i was older uh that for several months uh they had had a spike in people coming forward and things of that nature and then Right close to the end of the of the time we were there, um, the last few months, no one was coming forward. And so on a Sunday night, uh, he uh, did a sermon. Uh, he had done plenty of times in some capacity or another, just not a full sermon on it, but he had did a sermon on God's grace and God's love and also on God's... Uh, mercy and that he will forgive you uh for anything that you do and uh talking about repentance and talking about salvation at the time the youth group uh along with college age i'll put the college age in there as well at the time the group was probably about 35 to 40 strong in the congregation that my dad was preaching at and this stuck with me as a small kid, and it's still I still remember it to this day. When, we, when he offered the invitation, and they all sat together, I kid you not, that entire youth group and college section stood up and came forward. And they, we, I think that night there was... 15 responses to be restored, six asks to be baptized, and two to ask to be rebaptized. Out of a group of about 35. And it's all because you have to talk about the fact that you have to deny yourself. Christ talked about this, and I'm going to say this to our listening audience who might be listening on YouTube when we, uh, when we post this, this is how we're going to end this. 
you had to, Christ said it best when he said, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. There are things in our lives that we just cannot understand that we cannot fathom. And there, there are going to be times where we're going to fall short. We're going to sin there. And it might be right now that you're not living, uh, in the knowledge of God. Uh, and understand that this book gives us all that we need that pertains to life and godliness and what we can understand is God loves us. God cares for us. God is all powerful. He has an ideal will that none should perish He has a circumstantial will that there are going to be those who are going to believe. And there are those who will not believe. And his ultimate will is that there are those who will be split between the good and the bad, the sheep and the goats, the ones that go to heaven and the ones that go to hell. We have to be baptized in the New Testament way of Christianity to be able to understand the greatness of that. And so I say this to those watching by YouTube. We thank you for saying this. Uh, those on here on uh, Zoom, uh, hang out for just a second after I end the recording. Uh, we, I do have one quick announcement that I would like to say, but I want to end this uh, Zoom call for the YouTube part of this uh, by saying a prayer. And if... Uh, we could have a prayer and then we will, uh, in the zoom call, may God bless you. May God give you peace, uh, for those watching. And, uh, we thank you for tuning in our father in heaven. We're just so grateful for each one here and each one that would, that will be watching this on YouTube. Uh, we thank you, uh, that, uh, you have given us this Avenue to be able to speak about, uh, your goodness, your, uh, power, your knowledge, and your grace and we thank you so much heavenly father for this avenue that we are able to come and be able to be a part of your kingdom uh thank you heavenly father for sending your son who died on that cross so that we might have life uh thank you so much for that and we pray that we will live for you faithfully if we haven't uh, please give us uh, the strength to understand, the humility to uh, change, and the, uh, the strength to go forward in life uh, on that narrow path. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. So let me...